Welcome, everybody, to the Human Happy Hour with your hosts, Jason Argento and Rena Goldman. Today's guest is Emma Kinema, a union organizer and tech worker. She is the senior campaign lead of Code CWA, the Communication Workers of America's campaign to organize digital employees, and a founding member of Game Workers Unite. She began her journey as a games industry organizer in the late 2010s. And this year, Kinema was recognized in the Fast Company Queer Top 20 or Top 50 list. Uh, so welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. being with Appreciate us. It. Um, <clears throat> first thing I have to ask is, how nerdy can I get? Because I love video games, but I don't know if you love video games. Definitely. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not sure. Like, are you up on the newest ones? Like, if I start talking about stuff on Steam, would you be like, yeah, I know what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> Probably, like, dial it into a 7 or 8 out of 10. Um, okay. A lot of games, but also I'm kind of a nerd, and I play Genshin Impact and some stuff that most people don't play. So mm -hmm. it's a mixed bag. Okay. So, like, Starfield might be no, but, like, um, the, like Helion, possibly, or... Like more of the sure, indie sure. film, indie games. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. More indie oh, okay. games. All right, cool. Um, well, okay. So, what got you started in this in this field? In terms of union organizing. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've been involved with organizing in one way or another for the past like ten or twelve years. I I would say at this point, um, for a long time, I first got into organizing through political organizing. I met unions uh, through that work and had my first organizer training. So ever since then, I've just been involved in one way or another. Um, I've been involved in organizing in a number of different industries, not just games and tech. But yeah, definitely in terms of the stuff I'm working on now, that starts in like about 2018 when myself and others founded Game Workers Unite. And then in 2020, we founded Code CWA and have been doing union organizing and tech and games since. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's, it's, it's quite a tall order. I, I feel like to be able to, to uh, organize, especially in those tough industries, because you're facing these gigantic companies, uh, you know, so it, what are some of those, what are some of the th the things that that I guess work? What are some common issues that video game and tech workers face? How do you how do you address that? How do you get people to come together in those tough spaces? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a pretty hard industry to organize in, um, thinking. to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I think it takes a lot of patience more than anything else, a ton of education work as we slowly change the culture of the industry. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with, you know, the tech industry in particular having kind of this individualist, you know, I can make my way to the top, I'll be a CEO one day type mentality. And overcoming that and overcoming the the baggage that comes along with a culture that supports that. Um, takes a lot of effort. Um, but, you know, it is totally possible. You know, we've organized over like 4,000 workers into our union in the last couple of years alone. Um, we've organized, you know, not just at like startups and small companies, but also massive companies like Alphabet and Activision Blizzard and Zenimax and, you know, you name it. So it is possible to organize. It just takes, I think, again, a lot of patience and a lot of education work more than anything else. You ever work with um, companies that have to do with uh, the hardware of, of video games and streaming and stuff? Like, are you familiar with the whole GoXLR thing that happened? With... Yeah, we haven't had a whole lot of experience with that so far. A lot of it's been on the more like developer end. Um, but I'd be super curious and interested to dive into that kind of organizing too. Um, yeah. As if yeah. we don't have hands full enough. Yeah, Rena, so you know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, I... Go XLR was that amazing, awesome device that I had that I could every once in a while make my voice really low. Oh, but okay. was it about a few months ago? All the all the employees got fired in Canada, and so now all the all the um, firmware updates they're saying within a year the the uh, the device will be dead. Costs like three hundred dollars, 
<laughs> and wow. they're like, it'll work for a while, but eventually, since then nobody's doing any updates, it'll eventually not be compatible with your software. And I, I don't really know why they were fired, to be honest. I, I don't, I never really looked into it, but sounds like something that's terrible. Yeah, it does sound pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not that uncommon of an experience in our industry, whether you're talking about the hardware side or the software side. Layoffs are unfortunately a really harsh reality right now. The games industry in particular is facing a bunch of layoffs across companies like Bungie and Unity and Ubisoft. So um, yeah, it's it's not the prettiest picture to organize in, but um, you know, a lot can come out of also some of these experiences. People really have their consciousness changed often when you realize, oh, I really am a worker. I actually am expendable. I'm not some mm -hmm. special professional or something like that. The company really does see me as just another dollar in the spreadsheet. So, you know, there's a, there's always kind of a bit of a silver lining to these kinds of things, but yeah, the layoffs are pretty brutal. So Emma, just a little background on me. I work in media and where layoffs are, constant so i've been i've been through four layoffs in like less than 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 um 10 years yeah and you just and you i mean i learned that lesson day one like the first company where they're like oh you're a family i'm like no no and i always tell younger workers and I'm like listen your your colleagues will look out for you the company will never look out for you so don't ever depend on the company and and that's how i keep eating honestly as is, is i have colleagues and they will give me freelance work and that's how I survive. And I try to pay it forward and give other people work when I'm somewhere safe. And I sort of tell people to try to build that to survive because companies don't, they don't care. So I imagine the people in, in um, gaming and those industries face and tech face a similar probably, situation. They probably are really looked at as gig workers. Like they probably are, it's almost like, a second like like um like a characteristic that they're they're associated with which is probably really difficult for them because like who's who better to be a gig worker than somebody that works on computers and can do it over over distance and you know and that's not that's not cool <laughs> it's not cool at all um people need stability but we're in a capitalist society and that the <laughs> that's pretty much the way it works I, what is it saying the the best way that owners of companies can um cut wages or cut cut costs as wages and that's yeah. people <laughs> that's human beings it's not some yeah. labor relations question this is like yeah. human lives and human people being affected and it's unfortunately yeah like like you're saying kind of common but rena i really liked what you were talking about in terms of like folks keeping each other afloat in the industry that's definitely mm -hmm. something that i see a lot in games and tech people really do a lot of like kind of parallel work like helping each other stay afloat find new jobs as like these layoffs go on and things like that so um i think that's alive and well in tech too yeah it's it's interesting because we just had the sag after a um uh strike and um that's what you do is you try to create things like that for gamers right or game game developers and stuff is that essentially it or am i in a, in a sense um i think strikes are definitely the most visible part of union organizing so it's definitely what comes to mind for most people um and certainly organizing can lead up to strikes that's not you know the most uncommon thing but um i think the big thing is is you know what the sag after strike represents which is like bringing together people and community mm. to coordinate their action to coordinate their leverage against the company we well, yes. can do that in a lot of ways, not just striking. But yeah, that's that's the kind of ultimate crux of what we're doing as as organizers. Wow. So, wow, you're really facing a huge Goliath, really, because the whole country is designed around wanting to have a bunch of workers that are out of work so that they can keep the other employees down because they know they're replaceable. So it's like all the these giants are against it, you know, I mean, from the government to owners of companies and all they want really is product and money. Oh yeah. I mean, there's been a multi-decade onslaught against organized labor since, you know, really at the end of world war two and certainly into the sixties and seventies. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, so much is set up against organizing. So much is set up against workers coming together. But, you know, we still have to do the hard work of kind of gritting our teeth and and still doing that, still desperately trying to, you know, make connections with people, build trust, build relationships, and kind of tie folks together in a way that, you know, can actually help folks and not have everyone isolated and scattered in the way the boss would like. So what is that for people that only see the strike side of things like when that goes through the the news cycle what is that organizing what does that work look like for people that aren't familiar or haven't haven't seen that and just see that strike? yeah kind of like what's the back side of organizing is that what yeah you're or like how do you how do you start how do you you know facing say you've got a company and things are, are tough for people but nobody's there's no cohesion nobody's together what, what do you do in that instance yeah that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the number one thing, the ultimate kind of building block of organizing is one-on-one -on -one organizing conversations. So really, it, it maybe sounds a little trite or something or overly simplistic, but the ultimate thing, the kind of thing you spend 90% of your time doing in organizing is simply just talking to people, learning about them, listening to their issues, listening to the things they care about, um, and connecting them, you know, connecting with them on those issues. Um, and yeah, so I, I would say like, that's really the work that you see on the, on the back end of organizing. Um, it's a lot of conversations, a lot of meeting, a lot of getting people on the same page and um, kind of sharing stories and things like that. There's a lot of kind of relationship building work, if that makes sense. Yeah. How, um, I have, how many games have you, uh, do you, do you see a lot of games die because of issues in like you know people uh, you know people being laid off suddenly that games that were people were really looking forward to um and then like all of a sudden the game just dies yeah you know? i mean i think also games that people will never hear about too um i yeah. personally worked on games at studios where um ultimately got shelved and people got laid off or shifted to other projects and people might have spent years on that particular project and now they just have a gap in their resume where they have nothing mm. to show for it. Oh, and God. Yeah. I mean, and then that keeps oh, you kind gosh. of beholden to the owners of the company because yeah. now it's like, well, I got to get something in my resume. I got to get some project in my portfolio um, that you can publish. So it, it, it's rough. So if, if a project just does, if they kill a project, the person can't still say in the resume, I worked on this project, even though it didn't, come to fruition that, oh yeah that ends up, oh that's oh, awful yeah. no companies love to do that they'll make you sign waivers and stuff and say you can't uh, put things in your portfolio and all kinds of things they the companies are really really harsh and strict about that so what do people do in that when you're trying to get another role or or work the best thing you can do is essentially work outside of your work <laughs> um, yeah. where you're kind of making your own projects with people that you know or creating your own like art if you're a 3D artist that you can demonstrate on your portfolio. But it means doing like extra work on top of your normal day job. Um, I am very familiar with that life. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's so exhausting. I. I keep saying lately, I'm like, all of this technology that we have, why is this making us work more and it's making our lives <laughs> yeah. harder? Exactly I, I what just... it does. <laughs> yeah, it's it seems counterintuitive, right? Um, but, you know, I think one of the things we talk about a lot in our organizing spaces is that, like, tech can have a liberatory component to it. Like, it really can free people up from labor. It can free people from difficult tasks. It can, it can make menial things automatic. Um but only if it's in control by workers, right? If it's in the control mm -hmm. of the bosses, it's always going to be employed yeah. for the sake of making profit. And often that's at contention, direct contention with the needs of the community, with society, and with the workers who actually work on the products themselves. Yeah. Capitalism again. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. That, that kind of brings us to the, the thing that I've been like the, dying to ask you about, which is, is AI. Mm -hmm. And and how that factors in to organizing, because even like in my field, you're facing chat GPT and some of these other things. And like all of us that are writers and editors are like terrified because we're like, I don't know how to do anything out like this is how I make my living. And if this thing replaces us and so I would imagine that tech workers 
are faced with something similar. So do you have a take on AI? How do workers keep their rights? I, what happens? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there's really only two prongs by which you can kind of make sure that AI is not used for bad purposes. And um, I think that's legislation and I think it's organizing. Um, we actually have like a national commission in CWA where we've brought together a bunch of members and, and staff and leadership across the union to talk about AI specifically and actually have our own policy stances on it as organized labor. Um, Cause it is really important and critical uh, and not just to our members who are in, in, in the tech industry, but it really, it's going to affect call center workers. It's going to affect teachers. It's mm -hmm. going to affect healthcare workers. It doesn't really matter what industry you're in over time, it's going to be seeping in. So I think, you know, it's really important that we have our own independent stances on the subject that we can like push for legislation. We can push within the company to constrain what the company is using different tools and products for and, and hold the companies accountable directly as workers. I think that's the best way to go about it. Yeah. And if we were, we were if we were working under a different financial system, AI would be something that we'd be excited about because we would realize, oh, wow, this is going to make our lives easier. But it doesn't mean that in, in a capital society. It means, oh, our bosses are going to find other ways to to exploit all the free time that we have and expect more results. Um, and, and that's just disgusting. <laughs> like really it just is. And people just eat it right up. They're like, that's right. Capitalism in America, like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'll get off the capitalism thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm right there with you. So it's all good. <laughs> I've been burying myself in the whole capitalism thing. I've been watching a lot of second thought and, um, a lot of uh, I've been reading a lot of stuff and, and just just really just diving into it a lot. And there's no positive to it. It's like great to come out of feudalism. Like capitalism is really good when you're in the feudalist society. And then it just starts to need to be replaced again. And America, with all these huge rich people and, and people that are just so powerful, they don't want it to stop. So they just incorporate the uh, the indoctrination process. So everybody just thinks it's about, you know, you're religious, you're God and you and you're a capitalist. And if you're not those, you're not American. And 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 so people just say stuff and they don't really know what they're saying. They're just they've just been told to say it. If you just think about it for a couple minutes, you can you can see yeah, I mean, different. I, I I don't know how many folks I know, like, especially growing up in like a, a rural Midwestern area of the country, like so many people who will say that like they're pro-capitalist and it's like, well, man, you're not a capitalist. Like you're a worker, my friend. Yeah. Like, yeah. you're and you hate your boss, you hate your company. And yet yeah. you can't put two and two together and understand yeah. that our society is currently run by those same bosses and companies that you say you hate. Um, yeah. and suddenly when you kind of break it down in a simple way like that, it's kind of hard not to acknowledge, you know, the real elephant in the room, the actual problem at the root of things. Yeah. But they've been taught a person that isn't doing anything is useless. Mm -hmm. So you have to have three jobs. You, that's a, that's the American, you, you have like the American badge of honor. If you're like a single, a single parent with three kids three jobs like you're like considered you're doing it wow how how powerful that's so amazing no it's horrifying mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Absolutely. Like, oh yeah all right <laughs> how does ai help you when you when you do you use to use it to organize or anything that's a really good question mm -hmm. um yeah. we have played with it a little bit um honestly just out of curiosity in terms of like writing slogans and writing like materials and stuff for organizing we never use that stuff because obviously I think the best stuff is going to come from people and the mm -hmm. most creative, inspiring stuff comes from people. So um, it's not something we've really used at all yet at this point in a serious way. Um, mm -hmm. But it is an interesting kind of curious question that, you know, maybe begs more thought. Yeah. Well, like um, it's great for brainstorming and it's great for uh, uh, beginning the process. Like um, I've been playing Starfield and, each character has like, unfortunately, three the, the main characters have like three things they say when you walk by them. And that's it. And I've been playing that for 
sorry, 500 hours. So every time I go by Barrett, he says, is that your stomach or mine? And I've heard that sentence a thousand times going by the character of Barrett. And I thought to myself, if these people, when they had the actors in the studio, had chat GPT while they were making this, they could have just said, here's here's Barrett's character. Give me 100 things for Barrett to say that are general and but and and you wouldn't even have to like come up with them they would just be like like you know hey i don't know what they are but chat gpt could at least give you 50 good ones and stuff like that i think it's really good at um and you have the right and you have the ability to veto things like oh that's dumb chat gtp you know what i mean oh that one i wouldn't have thought of that's what i think it's really good at as long as we're still paying narrative designers and writers, I'm all for it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. As long as it's yeah. them using the tools and not, you know, some business owner who's kind of circumventing the creative process. Yes, I, I agree. Yeah. So where do you see any positive, helpful uses for it? Because I, I when I look at the writing aspects of it and what I like, all of it just seems like we're trying to take these jobs away from writers that's what it feels like and that's the way it seems like it's being applied and some of these companies are even like uh you know doing it saying telling actual writers oh you we won't work with you if you use ai in your work but then they're on the sly using it and pumping out articles with it and so i i, I wonder like if it wasn't driven by capitalists and people just wanting to crank out more profit what are some good applications that could help people and make make work make life easier do you see any in, in the tech area yeah i think so i mean i think some of the best applications for it come in the technology kind of sphere um especially like in terms of making technologies that like can help people or you know handle things in a disaster or respond to you know different circumstances that like it might be dangerous for people um you know i think there's a lot of potential for ai technologies um in a lot of different ways but yeah unfortunately like you're saying when it's controlled by business owners it's not going to be used in the ways that are liberatory and good for people it's going to be used in ways that are just for making money and replacing workers yeah and it'll lose that heart also um totally. One of the things that they say about um, Starfield is it's a, it's a mile long and an inch deep. And it's true. It's a huge game. But you can tell that they really just didn't care when it came to character development and stuff. I mean, and, and I can just see that being more um, common if people are using AI, at least until it becomes some kind of crazy sentient being, which <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea yet. But um, yeah, it'll just be shallow. Everything will be very, very thin. No depth, it seems. But I think people should learn how to use it because I think that's going to also protect your job. Um, if you're, Because it's not easy. I just did a film festival over the weekend uh, called the, I think it was called the 48-Hour Horror AI Film Festival or whatever in LA. And I was working over, over Zoom. And um, we we actually got into the festival with our film <laughs> um, and it's horrifying. <laughs> but basically, we just used ChatGPT, Dolly and Midjourney to create um, images that were based on the script that we had ChatGPT write. Um, and then we took the images and we put it into Runway and um, I can't remember, Gen 2, something like that, and um, and made it into animation. And then edit it together on uh, Premiere, um, and then we had AI make music and everything. <laughs> um, and we now know where AI is when it comes to making films. Just so you know, it's not ready, <laughs> not <laughs> ready at all. <laughs> right, but we do to see now what it's going to be. And actors are in a lot of trouble. And I hope that was in the SAG after thing about protecting people because William Defoe doesn't want to do it. Psh We'll just get get we'll just use AI and make William Defoe. You know what I mean? Like it's and and I'm talking and actually more so is uh, the actors that are not famous because they're the ones that really get hurt, or not the famous ones that are super rich. 
Totally. Um, yeah, I can I can definitely imagine a circumstance where you've got all these kind of lower level voice actors, especially in games, for instance, oh. where you record maybe an hour or two session and then the company makes a voice model based off of you and mm -hmm. throws that at the wall. And yeah, yeah, I mean, without proper protections and without like really good union contracts that outline terms that make sure that workers are being paid for that still. Um in a way that's like fair and sustainable. I think without that, it's a really kind of dangerous tool. Um, yeah. Even though right now it's still early on and, and you can't fully replace people in the creative process, but, you know, I can totally imagine at some point that being the case and, you know, that could be some problems for sure. Although I guess like if you, ha if you force protections where they had to be compensated fairly every time you use, even if you made that, likeness mm. every time that you used it that might not be a bad gig because then you only have to show up once and you keep getting paid but only if that you can make it so that yeah that there's a fair compensation model for using any even if it's an ai generated version of you which yeah. would which would take legislation which leads me to my question i'd love more clarification on when you're sitting and you realize there's something that needs to be done about something. What do you do to be to to influence legislation? Like, what's the process? Um, like yeah, go, you go right down the to the city hall, or like, what what do you do? Um, are you asking the like union organizing context or in general? In general, like like say you just we were just talking about the voice acting thing. Like, if you see that that's going to become a problem. Do you, what would you do to try and help if if that were what you choose that's what you chose to to take on i i would honestly say like i think the best avenue uh, maybe i'm a broken record is like supporting sag aftra in those mm -hmm. fights where they're kind of fighting for their tools um mm. and kind of policies around that and because it builds precedent them. yeah i think and and you can directly hold the companies to account with a union contract in a way that a lot of legislation can't and mm. i think you know even if you went the legislative legislative route i think positive legislation really only comes about when there's like a strong movement from below anyway mm. whether that's coming from a community or you know a, you know different groups of workers or whatever the case may be um so I think even then the people affected by it, these workers are going to be the most effective people to organize against it, which is essentially organized labor, just acting on politics and not, you know, just narrow workplace issues. Are there dangers when you're trying to get uh, groups organized that they might get fired if there's, if wind, you know, they get the wind of like, oh, so there's some kind of organizing going on, or is it like a secretive thing kind of? Yeah, yeah. I think good organizing always starts underground. Um, it starts with a phase of kind of not big, flashy, waving the banner and storming the barricades, but right. it's like <laughs> kind of like I was talking about earlier, some like some just basic conversations, relationship building, talking mm. to people, getting people together in a room for the first time to talk about the work, <laughs> you know, those kinds of early things. Um, you do that under the wow. radar. And once you have a strong organizing committee of like workers who are willing to do the actual effort of building their union, that's when you push towards a majority. That's when you start doing things that are more public and forthright. So that wow. way, by the time the company may want to retaliate, there's a huge you know surge from below and everyone is protected in a, in a right. much more powerful way. Wow. Do companies have like, like moles and place or anything i would imagine like myself if i were like this evil like corporate person i'd be like i would put i would put people in there and 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 i mean if i'm saying maybe i shouldn't give anybody ideas no no it, it it's definitely <laughs> a thing that happens sometimes um not wow. as common as you might expect but it is really it is a, a common practice at least for employers to often get like an anti-union organizing committee up and mm -hmm. running usually people who are really close to management or people who, you know, you can kind of buy off by offering promotions or whatever the thing is um, and have them as like workers fighting workers now and divide mm. like the, the workplace. Cause if it's workers versus boss, that's a really strong campaign. Yeah. But if the boss can get some, a small minority of workers to be anti-union and really loud about it, mm. that, that can really disrupt things in a really effective way. So um 
maybe it's not a mole uh, in yeah. terms of like infiltrating the actual organizing. Right. <laughs> but uh, it is common for bosses to use workers for their own ends. Disturbing. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> I, don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> so uh, what are some things in all of this that that give you hope? I guess where where do you see all of this going? And um, yeah, I, I guess talk a, talk a little bit about where have you seen some major wins, and do you see wins in the future? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, uh, it's almost hard to know where to start uh, in terms of listing positive things. I mean, we've just seen so much actually over the last few years. I mean, again, like I mentioned before. Over 4,000 workers are now organized into our union. These are tech game workers, um, which is really significant. And those workers are all like fighting for pay equality on the job. They're fighting against discrimination and imp bad employment practices. They're fighting for, you know, just cause rights. So that way the company has to prove that they aren't good at their job before firing them. You know, so many different things that just systematically overturn unfair workplace practices and overturn discrimination in the workplace on a huge scale. So it, I think those things are really positive. They really inspire me. Um, and I think the fact that more and more workers step up, the more and more campaigns succeed. Um, it's kind of, it's got a bit of an exponential effect. So um, even though, you know, maybe we've gone from zero to like 4,000 workers organized i can imagine a future where it spikes even further beyond that if that makes sense yeah and so do you follow labor movements in other industries how does that work do you communicate with with other leaders yeah absolutely um and we coordinate often with other unions um i remember like probably one of the best examples of that is um early when we were organizing at alphabet back before as a public campaign um, and Alphabet is the parent company of Google, if folks aren't familiar. Um, back in the early days of that, we were organizing and we we got in touch with some workers who were in the cafeteria line of work at the company. And they weren't organized yet, but we worked with Unite Here, the union that organizes those types of folks, and got them to organize like a whole several years earlier than they were going to. And so these people now had like protections and stuff way faster because the tech workers made those connections and, and kind of connected the dots across unions. Um, so there's like definitely a lot of opportunities for kind of solidarity and, and building connections across different unions and different industries. So it's definitely something I follow a lot very personally, um, constantly tracking the kind of movement of, you know, what's going on at UPS and what's going on in the UAW with the big three and, you know, what's happening with SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild and, all of these things are things we can draw really meaningful lessons from and use in our own organizing. Hmm. I've heard a lot of people on the left giving a surprising, a, like a surprised praise to Joe Biden and what he's been doing with uh, unions. Uh, yeah. But I don't actually know if he if he deserves it. And I assume you do know if he deserves it. <laughs> I at least have me? opinions on if he deserves <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I am no fan of the Biden administration. Um, personally, just all of the awful, awful things that really any administration in the history of the United States does on a regular basis in terms uh -huh. of foreign policy and domestic policy overrules in my mind any positive spots. That being said, 100%. there have been good, you know, positive things for unions under the Biden administration. Um, there have been new rules at the board that make it easier for workers to organize, that puts more penalties on bosses to prevent them from, you know, doing union busting campaigns in a more drastic way. Um, and, and, and things that help with, like, for instance, identifying joint employers so that way contractors don't fall through the cracks of organizing and these big companies can be held account. Um, but... Those things only happen because the labor movement is resurging again. It's not because Joe Biden is just like particularly into unions these days. Right. It's okay. Be it's because yeah. like there would be a problem on their hands if they didn't. Right. Right. It's just like FDR was never pro the, the New Deal. Like actually he ran originally against like those kinds of programs, but 
in the heat of the depression, he knew the only way to like stave off like mass revolt by the working class was to give some concessions. Right. Yeah. So this is just another example of when the movement is really strong, when it's starting to build up again, when, you know, bosses and, and the politicians who represent bosses, once they catch wind of that, they're pretty quick to give little concessions to, you know, make life a little easier. So that way you don't actually have a problem with the system as a whole. And you're just dealing with the scraps that you get thrown. So keep them right on the line of misery. Yes. You want to balance it. <laughs> a very delicate yeah. balancing act, you know, just oh, misery God. enough so that we can have our profit, <laughs> but not too much misery. So that way we want to steal the profits, you know? So messed up. I can't, I hate knowing this stuff so much because yeah. I have a lot of friends that do not know it and think I'm crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's so frustrating, but they're so much happier than I am. It seems. <laughs> There's something to be said for that blissful ignorance. Yes. Oh, my God. I like your necklace, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's uh, the flag of Venezuela on a star. Yeah, it's very cool. I like it. I'm going through our. I just want to talk about games, so I'm, I know I'm, I'm letting you. About... I'm letting you stay on task. What do you I, think about I, the yeah. day before uh, being uh, being considered possibly a, a fake game? <laughs> I have no opinion, honestly. <laughs> if I'm being candid. <laughs> oh, it's such a huge deal in the gaming world, though. Um, like, because yeah. apparently there are people working on it. But yet everybody thinks it's a fake game, and 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 yet they still think it's going to be coming out. It was like number one on Steam list. Yeah. But everyone's like, "Wait a minute, this isn't even a real game." And they're like, "Yeah, it is." And then they, oh, it's a nightmare. I, it's so fascinating to me. I don't There's know. Honestly, so much drama in the games industry. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> it seems like it. Well, you've got really critical people. Like people can make a game. And it, and even though, even though it's, it's like you, if you look at it and you look at, oh my God, people did this with ones and zeros. And then like people just come down on them and talk about the, the bad stuff and they will just hammer people into the ground for making this thing like uh, that's just still good. I mean, some, yeah. you know, like so critical. It's, it's hard to deal with sometimes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a miracle that any game gets made. It's yes. such a delicate, complicated bundle of all these different disciplines between engineering and art and design and writing and curate testing and production. And, you know, it's the most complicated art form in the history of humanity. It's Agreed. got the most diverse set of disciplines that go into it mm -hmm. more than anything else in the history of, you know, art. Yeah. And it's a miracle that any of it works. And especially as someone who used to work as a QA tester, Lord knows those games <laughs> are hardly functional for about the first 90% of their lifespan. Yeah. And then suddenly right before you launch, it gets all tightened up. And, it, you know, usually that's the crunch of a lot of workers. But yeah, um, it's a miracle that anything's playable. So if anything, yeah. shifts, I think that's a positive thing, honestly. I completely agree. <laughs> So I'm going to, so I don't really know anything about gaming. So I, maybe my <laughs> questions will be for the benefit for other people listening that don't know anything sure. about gaming. <laughs> so how long does it take? Like, can you explain the like, life cycle of a game? Like how long does it take to make? What is, you talked about the QA process. Now I'm fascinated by how all these parts come together and how long it takes and what do the workers put into it? Yeah, good question. Um, it definitely depends on what kind of game we're talking about. You know, a small indie game versus like a AAA studio like Activision Blizzard, very different. But the kind of work that goes into it is still very similar. You know, I think early on, you've got a lot of conceptualization work, kind of early drafting and designing and testing of different mechanics, you know, seeing if this and that is fun or not. Um, and then eventually kind of starting to polish it, you know, you have artists making all of the assets and environments and the props that are used and the characters that are in the game and all these things. And, and this arc of organizing, of, of organizing production really culminates in QA testers at the end being the real, like, kind of bottleneck of the production process, which is interesting because these QA testers are actually poorly paid for the most part. They're kind of the worst treated discipline in the whole industry, but they actually have a huge amount of leverage. Wow. Because yeah, that right seems like the launch. most important thing, right? Like, yes. to, those are the, pe the people that make sure that you don't launch a 
failed product, but they're treated. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's like that final 10% that really locks in that this is going to be a a quality product that people are actually going to buy. Um, Mm. And without that, you know, the company is just in a disaster mode. So that's a little bit about the, just like a super simplified version of the life cycle of a game, I would say. And, you know, when you're talking about the bigger games, it's usually on the scale of three, four, five years or so, um, wow. give or take a little bit. So people are developing and like, so you might be QA testing the same game for like five years or something potentially? It, that is possible. Or- um, usually they have you shift to products that are closer to launch and then they'll move you when the next thing gets close to launch. Um, Cause QA is most helpful towards the end of the life cycle. Um, but often you still do have QA throughout the whole thing. Um, just like usually they have lower amounts of folks involved early on. Wow. Um, yeah, the, I, I didn't think about it the way that you just phrased it, that it's one of the most complicated art forms because of all the different disciplines and things that people have to do. And then they have to bring all yeah. that together. And yeah, I... I have a lot of respect for anybody that can do any kind of art or any skill that I can't. So I'm like, yeah, these people should be paid. This seems super hard. (laughs) uh, And it's just, yeah. And and then you come up with this, this product and then the people that are making sure that this product is, is good and works. And those are the treated the worst, which is just, yeah, just kind of, so is that like, was being in QA and being in that environment and being treated that way? Did that have, uh, an effect on why you decided to start organizing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always knew that we needed to organize the industry anyway, because any unorganized industry should be organized, in my opinion. Um, there's only upsides and really no downsides to it. Um, so, but yeah, definitely having worked in QA, having kind of seen the, you know, the dirty side of the industry, if you will, um, the kind of rougher side of it where people can't hardly make ends meet and you have to have multiple jobs to stay afloat and you can hardly afford housing and, you know, all these things that comes with being a QA tester often. Um, definitely, definitely motivates someone to be involved in union organizing, to say the least. I, I read a couple of the articles i think some you wrote and some were profiles and i was surprised by the horrible treatment of women and femmes like and i guess not surprised given our culture but i guess Mm -hmm. given the like the time period so it it reminded Mm -hmm. me of i have a, a friend who's in her 70s and she worked in like the advertising industry and she said that men would do things like hide her paycheck or you know like just awful things and some of the the stuff that i read that from you like made me think and i'm like oh that sounds it sounds like somebody in this trying to work in the 70s in in that industry and i'm like how depressing is it that we we haven't gotten any better uh so can you talk about what what that's like to be in that culture and do you feel like there have been any breakthroughs in that to make it a little better yeah i think there have been some improvements and breakthroughs i think we saw a huge culture shift over the last couple years in particular um between things like the 2019 riot walkout at riot games um women and a bunch of people supporting uh walked out over kind of how the company was silencing harassment victims and abuse victims uh, using NDAs and things like that. Um, and, you know, in 2021, we had the walkout at Activision Blizzard, which was over the kind of rampant culture of sexual harassment and abuse and things. Um, and, you know, I think it's just kind of been shed a light on in a way that's like really profound. And now like everyone who enters the industry, like all the students in game development schools and people who are trying to get into the industry, they all know that this is a problem going into it so they can be more guarded um, for the folks who are affected by this culture and then also um, be a part of actually changing it for the folks who have any kind of sway over the culture of the industry. So uh, definitely there's some changes, uh, but it still unfortunately just is the case, right? It's an industry where women are predominantly underrepresented in almost all titles, um, 
really across the board, whether it's uh, design or engineering or writing, um, really art is the only place where you get to see a lot of women and non-binary folks and things like that. Um, but, you know, still there's improvement being made and, and I, I think there's some bright future ahead. Hmm. I'm curious. Uh, I used to own a, I used to own a video store, which totally fits my profile in life. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> um, I, I learned as an, as, as a owner and manager, especially in the teens, teens to early twenties that females were much better at everything <laughs> I felt. <laughs> um, and I started to feel like I was contributing to, um, I, you know how you can almost reverse something and go, whoa, 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 now you're, now you're, now you're hurting the cause by, by going too far. You know what I mean? Like this, it, it seems like there has to be a balance in order to actually not accident, you know, I don't know if I'm making sense there, but like, I felt like I was almost saying now being prejudiced towards males. Um, but I was right. Females were better at everything. <laughs> they just, they were, they were just better workers. They're smarter. And I know, and, and I'm sure that has something to do with the age too. Um, do you think that, um, there's any fear of that in the future as far as like, like men, do you think that's why men keep women down? because there's some, any kind of fear of that, or do you think it's just a testosterone ape thing? Uh, yeah. those, aren't, those aren't the only two choices. <laughs> yeah, good, good question. I, I do think it's a little bit more complicated than those two questions. Yeah, two it is. Yeah, those, just those two. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I think, honestly, like a lot of it comes from just embracing the status quo. People don't like to go against the status quo and the culture mm. has been established like that for so long that to, to speak out against it is kind of to make you kind of a, a an easy target. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, it's just people not being motivated and being apathetic um, towards the, the matter that kind of keeps it in place. I, I don't think there's a lot of mustache twirling men in the industry who are, you know, <laughs> out there just to ruin some woman's day or something. But, um, right. you know, it, a lot of it comes from like kind of a culture of laziness. In, indoctrinated kind of a thing. Yeah. And it's just all you've known in the industry. And so yeah. you kind of get used to it um, mm. at some point. So I think that's the biggest obstacle, honestly. And, and I think both women and men and other folks um, can be aff totally affected by that kind of, you know, kind of status quo mentality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, people should just be um, judged on their merit and their capabilities and leave gender out of it somehow. Yeah, and this industry really does <laughs> like to think it's a meritocracy, but Lord, is it not? Um, yeah. I mean, just time and again, I've seen so many, you know, marginalized folks across the board who work harder, are more creative, more inspiring than like the people they're working with who are, you know, just cishet males or something. Um, and time and again, it's the cishet males who get, you know, promoted and and moved up into better roles and things like that. So, um you know, it's certainly not a meritocracy by any means. Otherwise, I think we'd see yeah. very different demographics in, in leadership and in higher senior roles and things like that. Yeah, you're right, though. I agree. It is totally in our society. And I, I have felt it myself being on the side of um, accidentally um, uh, falling victim to making assumptions like that about women or different races. Like, I grew up um, and it, it, I grew up always wanting my main character in a movie to be a white guy. And then he had sidekicks. That's how I grew up. Now I don't care. Like one of my favorite shows is happy Valley. And I love Catherine and she is a hero. And, and she's like this cockney British woman. And she's I to me, she is what, what Arnold Schwarzenegger was in the eighties. She's, I just love her to death. Um, and I think that, feeling that you, that I had to break out of people sometimes have no interest in breaking out of it. And it, and it, it makes its way into jobs and work and life. And, and so you start to, you start to cast people by who they are before you even decide what they're capable of and, or how, what their worth is. And I, so I agree completely. Um, I and got out of it. 
<laughs> it's, it's ironic too, because like, I think, especially for folks in my generation and below video games is like one of the big media that they kind of take in as kids and they learn, you know, bad cultural assumptions and things from, mm -hmm. And that comes then to bite them in the back when mm -hmm. you're trying to get a job and those same things that you were programmed with are now influencing the workplace, right? So it's it's definitely, you know, an evasive problem. Yeah. And you have to work at changing it if you're a person that is, uh, you know, perpetuates it. Like I, I was so bad, I couldn't play Tomb Raider because I just didn't want to be a girl, which is ridiculous to me now. Oh, wow. Absolutely ridiculous to me now. I realize how stupid that Jason was. I can't tell you how stupid that is. But I had to work at getting out of that. Not It wasn't something that just happened. Yeah. And it's, it's like you have to make a mental decision up here in the frontal lobe and then train the lizard brain. <laughs> it, it, that's what it seems like. And you have to be willing to do that. Otherwise, you just live and do and cause more mayhem, and more suffering. Yeah, I definitely, I, I never want to belittle the process of overcoming, you know, different, um, either discriminatory or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of backwards ways of thinking, reactionary ways of thinking. It can be very difficult. It can take a lot of effort. Um, it's not to say like people should be given free passes because they don't want to do the effort and it's tiring or something, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it is real effort like you're saying it takes it takes a while for people to change their mindsets and um yeah it's it's a process certainly so yeah you know, you're talking about games that people grew up with and made them want to get into this field can you name some did you play games when you were a kid and can you name some that you liked when you were a kid and then you were like you maybe you got older and were like oh these are very offensive or this can you give mm. some examples of that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I definitely played games as a kid. One of my earliest memories is having Pokemon Red um, and uh, playing that game way back in, what, in, I mean, it must have been the 90s or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, always played video games growing up. I think probably if you want an example of some of the worst stuff would probably be no offense to people who worked on it, but like Modern Warfare 2, Call of Duty, oh, probably yeah. is as yeah. about as bad as it gets with, you know, just generally an atmosphere of racism, of chauvinism, of, you know, machismo and things like that. And GTA. Yeah, GTA probably doesn't help. I thankfully didn't actually play that as a kid. That probably would have messed my brain up a little bit. Yeah. But I know plenty of people who did play it. Um, and yeah, I mean, people copy the behaviors they see in their media and like reproduce it on the school playground and things like that, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then reproduce I, it in the workplace. I had an ex that played that Call of Duty and I hated that game. So it's very, vindic it's very vindicating to hear you say the rage. <laughs> oh, I still have any kind of Call of Duty. I have like just a rage against. I'm just I, I don't care. I just see the Call of Duty. I'm like, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so I did like your answer. there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of that game either. I, I just think it's kind of boring. Personally, I like Daisy. That's my that's my style. <laughs> I like long trips to disappointment. That's what I enjoy. <laughs> um, so I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say what you were, uh, another thing that I'm happening right now, going through in my life right now is my, I, and I don't even know how to phrase this is how much I'm, I'm still learning. Mila, my daughter. Nope. See, I fucked it up already. Has become Nicholas. I, you know what I mean? Like, how would I, how do I tell you that without accidentally dead gendering or naming? Like, you know what I mean? She now, see, Nicholas is my son now. There. Um, How, it is so hard to not accidentally do that. And the one thing that he helps me with is he's willing to let me ask any questions I want. And he's willing to, um, let me make mistakes and but i have to be willing to do that process you know what i mean um so i it, it's another trip along the way of me being born you know cis heterosexual white 
in Vermont <laughs> as, as I keep finding these things that I have to do. And I do them because I love people and I want to treat them with respect. Um, a lot of people don't seem to want to do that. I know it sound like I'm totally uh, uh, complimenting myself, but I'm saying there's a, my point is, is you can do it. Humans, you can do it. And it's nothing but positivity to do it, to go through the processes. Yeah. And I think, it, I think it's okay to mess up as long as you correct yourself, right? It's okay to mess up as long as the effort is going into it and you're trying to override, like you were saying earlier, the lizard brain that re just does things on instinct or yeah. old of behavior. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, like we were talking about before, it takes a lot of effort to, to change these patterns of thought and behavior. It's not something that can always happen overnight. And I think the defining thing is like, I'm personally, for me, I'm willing to like take the time to be patient with someone if they're messing up with me too. Um, so long as they're putting the effort in, right. I'm happy to like sit down and talk to someone, answer questions, educate them mm -hmm. um, if they're genuine. Right. Yes, exactly. So I was going to ask you, Emma, are there any games that get it right or that, that represent people very well or that like, what do you recommend or what do you say like this this is a good example of where things should be going yeah that's a good question um probably one thing that comes to mind well a couple of things come to mind if you're thinking about kind of bigger AAA games stuff like the last of us or overwatch i think does a pretty good job of being you know diverse and generally kind of progressive in the portrayal of people and and kind of realistic and grounded in, in different characters identities and things like that so I think there's there's um, a couple of good examples in big games but I think also in indie games in the smaller kind of games world um, there's a ton of things made by all kinds of different diverse creators and things that are very personal very meaningful projects often and um, you know I think that can be a really cool source of kind of progressive media in a way. I don't know if you've played Starfield, but they, they've done a really good job with it too, I think. Mm. You, yeah, every, I haven't played it yet. Yeah, you can you can follow a romantic um a plot a line a plot line with any character and male, female, doesn't matter. Um you know, every once in a while they'll give you an option to flirt with Barrett or something, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> and stuff. Um and it's interesting because I have found myself falling into the same thing there. I'm like, well, why not? It's just a game. I can I can I could go down a road with Barrett, right? And Simon, like, why not? You know, but it's still hard to do. You know what I mean? Like, it's a game, and I'm like, it's so weird. Like, why? Why? So I thought about the next time I play it, I'm just gonna explore that just in the game. Just, just going to. Just why not? Yeah, but there's no reason like not to. <laughs> somewhere inside, I feel like it's hurting me, and it shouldn't feel that way. <laughs> you can be on a, not attracted to someone. But the feeling that it would hurt you in a game is messed up. And I want to I want to conquer that about myself. Better to get those things out in a video yeah. with actual yeah. people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of issues uh, with that game. <laughs> is that the same game that you were talking about? Like yeah. that some woman in the game wanted to get you to get into a relationship and you were like, no, no. Yeah, I had the same thing because I'm 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 out of just out of a relationship. Not well, I guess it's a while ago now, but and I still want to be single in real life. And this girl in the in the game, Sarah, is like starting to get really into me in the game story. And I'm just and I had at one point I had an option. I will always think of you as a great friend and I want to take this to the new next level or something. And I was just like, I had all those feelings that I have in real life. <laughs> like, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want a relationship right now, <laughs> but I, it, it's so interesting. And that's, I think that's a sign of a good game. If it can affect you like that personally, you know, but I should probably chill out because it's a game and just do stuff. <laughs> Games are awesome. I'm sorry. Yeah, but they just it's are. pretty wild. It's like <laughs> you can have quite a range of experiences and stuff in games. It's a really strange and interesting art form, in my opinion. What's your big experience in a video game that 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 uh, made you so happy yet 
you, that you cried? Because I have several. Oh, man. Um, I'd probably have to point to like Night in the Woods or Undertale for that. Oh, wait, um, let me write these down because I'm going to go look at them later. <laughs> yeah, you should. I've never heard they're, of them. They're both smaller, like independent games. Um, but like Undertale, there's some really good stuff with like betraying friends and things that kind of comes up as a theme. Um, and like har harming people without intention and stuff like that. So um, anyway, there's there, there's actually the same themes in Night in the Woods now that I think about it. But um, I really both like those and they were like super emotionally moving for me, at least. Mm, I cried all the way through Last of Us. Oh, that really? game all the way through it. Every I, I could not believe how much that game affected me. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, oh, it, the whole it's pretty moving. Yeah. yeah, it's really well done. Yeah, I was so impressed with the second one with Last of Us 2. I was honestly like so affected by it that I couldn't watch my partner play it. Um, and you mean the there's a continuation out, out now or wait? Yeah, Last of Us Part 2. It's um, it came I out couple years ago oh yeah that one's the one i meant sorry yeah oh yeah yeah i didn't play the first one okay because there's a part two of that that hasn't come out yet gosh like, gotcha yeah, yeah okay. see what you're Which, talking about. they're yeah. probably waiting for the show to catch up or something because they probably don't want to throw the game out before the show but yeah oh is the good is the first one good okay it yeah the first good. one's really excellent i, oh. I prefer it myself i i just oh. found the, the second one to be a, a little too traumatizing um for my <laughs> but it, yeah. it is good it's really well written oh wow all right oh that's another one i'm good i'm just getting i just did this because i wanted game references i i'm now good because i know nothing about games <laughs> so i'm like googling i'm like oh there's a video game and a show it seems i'm like just discovering <laughs> this for the for the first time uh so are these these games do they involve is it mostly story or do they involve a lot of like this one is buttons like there's, there's a lot of <laughs> there are buttons unfortunately um it's not buttons. a movie <laughs> but uh you know there is there's a lot of kind of traditional kind of gameplay with like firearms and stuff like that um but it's very narrative heavy it's very like story centric and how it's structured and there's a lot of kind of character development that's really rich in that game um both good acting of, yeah really good acting very good acting um yeah so it, it's a it's an interesting game kind of very cinematic if you will did you play resident evil when it well probably not when it first came out but did you play resident evil the first one no no i didn't but i've watched my partner play mm -hmm. that's a uh, that's an example of bad acting <laughs> <laughs> like the characters i don't know where they got people but but like, yeah, they're spending money on stuff now. Like they, they've realized the game industry is bigger than the movie industry, like yeah. much bigger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, the games industry makes more than the movie and music industries combined. Yeah, it's wow. huge. Yeah. But what I don't understand, like, so I, I guess to give you some context, context <laughs> to me. So when I grew I was not allowed, not allowed to have it video games at all so it was like oh that'll rot your brain you're not allowed to have it so then after not not being allowed to have it you don't grow up learning how to play them so then you're like much older maybe high school college or what and somebody goes well here's a video game and then you're like i don't, I don't understand you know <laughs> and then and then it's like well i'm not gonna spend time learning this so i i have a hard time like movies right i love a book you know like where i'm like consuming this great story and i'm hearing you all talk about these experiences with the story and i'm like what is the appeal of the having to like work for the story i guess <laughs> like well i think there's a lot of substance that can come out of the mechanics of the game too um so gameplay itself not just like traditional storytelling in the context of a game, the game's mechanics itself can actually be kind of evocative in a lot of different ways. It's hard to kind of explain, but um, I don't think it feels like a chore for a lot of people. Um, unfortunately, games does have, in general, this kind of accessibility problem where it takes a, a lot of experience and kind of muscle memory to really learn how to play modern video games. Um, and so if you just didn't have that growing up or you just haven't been exposed to it enough, yeah, it's like you can't just pick up Last of Us 2 and play it and experience mm -hmm. the story in the same way. So um, 
there's kind of there's kind of that problem as a medium um but i think also like in terms of film and television like films and television like the editing techniques and the writing and the kind of the way they're produced now like if you took a person from 1920 and tried to sit them down in front of Mm. a modern movie they would not be able to parse the story i don't think they'd be able to track it because that you know we've been raised on movies and tv we've learned the language of cinema we know Mm. what editing looks like and, and what it implies when certain things happen and i think it's similar with games where like if you don't have kind of experience knowing how the medium works and how the kind of form of the medium is you you have this accessibility hurdle Mm -hmm. um i think it's a bigger accessibility accessibility hurdle than movies or tv for instance but but i think it all art forms have that in a way um there's some level of like learning learning curve or something yeah the big change i love the way you phrase that yeah I think the big change for movies was Pulp Fiction. Um, That was a big deal for editing. Like it was one, not that there weren't other movies that had edited strain in in, out of order, but that was the first one that did really well that everybody saw where they had to use their brain a little bit to like get used to what happened. You know what I mean? Yeah, Where like some more advanced editing techniques entered like popular film understanding. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a really good documentary on editing. Sorry, my background's in film and TV too. So, I'm... oh no, we need two more hours then. <laughs> yeah, you've accidentally like stumbled <laughs> into a whole black hole of information. But... I'm a filmmaker too. All right, yeah, well. <laughs> there's um, a really good documentary on editing that uh, has Quentin Tarantino in it, and he's mm-hmm. talking about like um, like old Soviet editor film editors and stuff, mm-hmm. and talking about how like pretty much no editing has been invented since then, like no new techniques. Like it was pretty much all figured out in like the thirties. Um, oh and it's just a What's matter the name of, like, of that? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Too. I really wish I could remember. I'll figure time. it out. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's really, I good. would like to watch that. Yeah. Yeah. I wish I knew the title of the thing off the top of my head. I don't anymore. The history of cutting. So what may. No, might be. Not it. All I know I'll is there's it. a part where Quentin Tarantino goes, those goddamn Russians just figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always been burned into my head ever since. So you you started in, t- it was that your major or did you do work there and then you transitioned to? I also worked in film and television. Um, but yeah, I, I, I studied film and television and game development in university. Um, and But most of my working career has been in games. Uh, honestly, and and not as much the film. Freedom's Fury? I don't remember what the title There's is. There's a sorry. lot of documentaries about USSR <laughs> and what they did. Oh, wouldn't, yeah, it wouldn't be that. Okay, go on, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Yeah, it's so fascinating because you have me just thinking about the way people ingest things and yeah, and like, what you, now I'm just going to tell people that talk about games, I'll say, well, I have accessibility issues because <laughs> it just sounds, it just sounds so much better than, you know, like, because if you actually give me a controller and attempt to try to teach me to play a game, I, like, I'm just like, I'm in, I'm just old and I'm just like, ah, and I have no patience and I get mad and I, like, I'm the one, the person that's going like this with the controllers and yeah <laughs> you need a like, gateway game like, I, <laughs> what's I, a good just... gateway game for rena what's a game that she might be like it's not too technically crazy so yeah i think I, probably the best game i could recommend is journey um it's a really amazing simple game the movement mechanics are incredibly simple and there's some pretty evocative, like environmental storytelling throughout it. Um, and I, I think it's very accessible. My mother has played it. My younger sibling played it when they were like four. Um, and yet it's still... like where you're you're placing my level. <laughs> <Four year> old. <laughs> Sorry. But you're probably but... right. You're probably right. But, oh, yeah. But it's still really a, a moving experience. It I really see is. it. Um, kind of like Mist was. Mist was a really simple game. But oh my god, did that game have me hooked? Yes. Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> First time you see a real person on a television talking to you, blew my mind in that game because everything's still and the whole thing. Oh my god. Yeah. I've yet to have that experience again. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Wow. 
I have I have so many things that I have to look up. And we are coming up on the hour and a half mark. Oh yes. So you you probably want to do your uh Yeah, your I have question, a right? a final question that I ask everyone. Um it's hypothetical. Okay. Um and it's kind of fun. <laughs> Especially for someone that does what you do. Um imagine yourself where you are, which is easy. Um and through the door, someone that looks exactly like you except their clothes are a little bit disheveled and they look like they've been through something um a little bit more than you are now of course you just just just, something's going on there and they say to you very seriously come with me i'm from the future what do you do that's a really good question (laughs) probably sit down and have like a 20-hour discussion with that person before doing anything (laughs) um which is maybe a really boring answer but it's my answer you may not have time (laughs) it is what it is i'm I'm gonna be too curious and fascinated by that situation to do anything else (laughs) that's awesome i'm sure shit not gonna trust myself from the future (laughs) like there's there's no way i would ever do that so um i guess that's where it's (laughs) what's your angle i think you're the yeah, you're the first person that said I'm not going to trust my future self. <laughs> like, that's that's interesting. They haven't earned my trust yet. I don't know what to say. Oh, that's hilarious. Well, yeah, because you don't know anything yeah, I guess going on. True. It's already yeah. so weird. How yeah. can you trust it? Yeah. And how do I know it's like a legitimate actual me from the future and not some duplicate? Anyway, you could go down the rabbit hole. Well, that's why uh, my friend, you have to do what my friend did and. uh I think he was kidding, but he has a really quick mind. His his answer very quickly was, I would ask him for the password. <laughs> and I was like, you have a password? He's like, of course. <laughs> a personal password? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. I just, it was best. That's what, that's what made that, that question stick with me for the rest of time. Was that nice. is his answer. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> using this forever. <laughs> nice. That's great. All right. So any is there anything that you want people to follow? Anything that you want to promote? Social handles or uh, sure. anything uh, you want to share? Yeah. I mean, if people are interested in following me, they can find me on Twitter or X apparently. But I still call it Twitter because my brain just works that way. Um, Emma Kinema. It's, I don't really tweet a whole lot, honestly, at this point, but I exist there technically. And then if people want to get involved with organizing in games or tech, um, we've got our website code-cwa.org. And on there, people can reach out to an organizer and get involved in organizing. Nice. That's great. And I, anyone that's watching, make sure you uh, subscribe to our channel on YouTube. That's the most, some. that's the least I can ask. And it's the most important thing. Everything else is gravy after that. Please, please do. <laughs> Yes, and like and share and oh yeah yeah things. definitely <laughs> for sure and yeah we'll i'll be editing this and um oh my god you're a filmmaker editing <laughs> sorry I, there's a there's a great i don't know if heavy do you use premiere um yeah premiere and avid were what i was tr- primarily trained on and used do you still edit a little bit sometimes but not a whole lot anymore i'm pretty busy <laughs> there's this insane tool now where you put uh, you probably know about it. I don't know, but you put the if you have two camera angles, you I use it for this actually. You put one on the top, um, uh, you put one one over the other, and then you assign the audio to the to them because you have them separate audio, and then you just press a button, and it goes back and forth between the cameras depending on the talking, and it also has you can set um, parameters like I want a one second delay every once in a while so that it does that thing where someone's talking and then it cuts right um and you can, or a j cut yeah yeah exactly like i it's it turned like four hours into 10 minutes yeah that's pretty <laughs> wild it's it's yeah. a really powerful tool for getting a rough cut in yes exactly yep yeah it's i love it i i just yeah it's <laughs> it's saved my life pretty much <laughs> nice <laughs> awesome all right do you have anything else, Rena? Um, well, I mean, I know. Thank you I, so much for yes. being with us. We probably could go on forever. About I know. I'm state like, of the world, damn. organizing, asking gaming questions. Uh, it, it really has been a, a pleasure to 
chat with you and I did learn more about games and and why they're not accessible to me. Um, so um yeah, so so thank you for for being with us and sharing yes, some of you. uh, your work with Absolutely. us. Appreciate it. And um sorry it took so long to kind of get our schedules lined up and stuff, but glad there it was finally able to work out. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Cool. Well, have a good rest of your evening, y'all. You too. All right. Bye.